Good evening, everyone. Welcome. And we're just going to get started with some worship and praise as we're engaging with our uh, midweek discipleship series. So I know some of you here are wrapping up your meal and some of you may be joining us from across the internet at home. We're very glad to see you and I just invite you to seek the Lord with us tonight as we praise his name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. And blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me. The world to fall as it should be. Blessed be your name. And blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. And every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise and when the darkness closes in Lord, still I will say blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your name Jesus blessed be the name of the Lord blessed be your glorious name God, you give and take away. Oh, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. God, you give and take away. God, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. There's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free.
Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship, fellowship, to be in your presence, and help us as we've just sung these words of being satisfied and in you and with you. Lord, help us to find our contentment and our hope and our peace in you. And I pray for all of us here tonight and those watching online that we would experience that peace, that your love would flow over each one of our hearts, that maybe we're uh, worried or frustrated or distracted, to help us to focus our attention on you, because um, you're always focused on us. There isn't ever a moment that we're not on your mind, that the number of good thoughts that you think towards us outnumber the sands of the the seashore, and that just blows our mind, but that's the depth and the width and the height and the length of God's love for us, and so we need that love to anchor us in this world of confusion and division, of anger and of hatred. We need the love of Christ that other people will know that we are your disciples by the love that we have for one another. Help that love to flow out of us, flow into us from you and out of us to others. And Lord, as we look at your word tonight, we pray that you would help us grow more in love with you and more in love with your word. We love you. We thank you. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's love. That's it, right? All you need is love. No. All right. Well, good evening. Uh, If you guys have your Bibles and your study books, I would encourage you to grab them and turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. That's pretty easy. That's the first chapter of the Bible. And uh, for all the kiddos that are here tonight with us, Pastor Dustin is going to take them to Disneyland right now. So it's an overnighter, so they'll be back sometime, I'm sure. And I do want to welcome all of you joining us and watching online. We're glad that you are virtually part of this study as we continue through our discipleship series, a a word, a theme, and a topic that the Lord put on our hearts here at Quest Church to focus, to to make it our focus for 2020. And uh, we we did that in the beginning. We actually made that decision in December of 2019, and then, well, you know what happened to 2020. Well, no one knows what happened to 2020, but uh, I couldn't think of a, a more important theme for all of us to be rooted and grounded in God's Word as His disciples, understanding His, His Word and uh, growing, especially taking this opportunity to grow in the Word and... Uh, grow in our relationship with the Lord and grow in our understanding of who He is and what He has called us to. And so uh, if you have been joining us over these past couple weeks, um, actually this last week as we started um, our series on the core foundational doctrines of Christian faith. And so last week we looked at uh, theology, theology proper. And so there we were um, looking at the Trinity in particular as it relates to the Godhead being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and uh, trying to wrap our heads and minds around a simple but complex uh, sort of idea there. And we kind of came away with the point that 
if God is all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, it would be ridiculous for us to try to distill him down into some formula that we can figure out. And, uh, but what we do have hope in is that God has revealed uh, himself to us in his word. What he wants us to know about him, he has already made very clear, not only naturally in the created world, because we looked at two points of, of God and his character and his essence, one being, one essence in three persons. We looked at God is the triune creator, and uh, we looked uh, as well as in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But uh, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so we see the Godhead involved in creation, but not only does God reveal himself in creation, he reveals himself supernaturally in his Word, and uh, more prominently through the person of Jesus Christ. Because in John 1, 14, we see that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So there's a revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a relationship that Jesus had pre-existent um, with the Father. And then we have the identity um, or the identification of Jesus as God. And Jesus was God, as the Scripture says. And so we see that God is the triune creator, but uh, he is also the traveling redeemer because he has a mission and a motive and a purpose behind his nature and his being, and that is to repair and redeem uh, the broken and severed relationship that God has with his creation. In fact, that's what we're going to transition into uh, this week in looking at the theme of uh, or the doctrine of humanity and of sin. It's actually, a theological term is homartiology. And uh, so hopefully you guys wrote all those words down, those big words. Actually, you've got your dictionary there, Eugene, so you can go ahead and look those things up. Uh, homartiology, soteriology, ecclesiology, pneumatology, eschatology, right? All these really big fancy words, but um, they're described for us systematically throughout the scriptures. And today, we're going to be looking at uh, this uh, teaching and doctrine, very important, of humanity uh, as well as sin and how sin has corrupted or um, distorted. And so we're going to see two, two themes related to this. One is the distinction of human dignity. And so if you guys have done your, your homework or did the study, you would have seen kind of a little bit of a breakdown. I've put them in my own words and just kind of uh, put together this study using the scriptures provided in the study guide. But uh, we have the distinction of human dignity. And what we mean by that is that every human life is created with incomparable uh, significance. And uh, we're going to look at that in Genesis chapter 1 in the power of God's creation, as well as the pinnacle of God's creation in human creation, male and female. And then the second part is the introduction of sin. So if there's this beautiful distinction and value and worth, intrinsic significance to every human life, then what happened was is that sin entered into the equation and because sin came in, it, uh, the, the distortion of human depravity then brought severe consequences. And those uh, consequences um, severed the relationship that humanity has with God. There is um, divine judgment, and there's these consequences that relate to it. Um, but uh, kind of in, in an opening, or just to get us thinking about... The, the connection between human worth and value and the brokenness that, that we all uh, experience because when you talk about um, the doctrine of humanity and of sin, we see that the human dignity that God initially created has been distorted by the depravity uh, of, of human choice and, and of free will. And one of the things that we came across when we were serving as missionaries in uh, Tokyo, uh, Japan, for five years, 
uh, was uh, this, um, this uh, uh, centuries-old tradition of Japanese tradition of art called um, kintsugi. And uh, kintsugi, K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I, kintsugi. And what's interesting about this um, form of artwork is that, uh, I don't know about you, but maybe you have something valuable like a, like a glass or a vase or, or um, you know, pottery of some sorts. And uh, if it gets broken, uh, well, what happens? You just kind of have to throw it out, right? Your favorite coffee mug. I don't know. Maybe that's something special to you. But you just throw it out. Well, with kintsugi, um, the, the idea is that they, take the, they don't throw away the broken um, pot or vessel. They, they actually mix together uh, gold and, and silver and, and precious uh, materials with, uh, with glue, and they piece back together these broken and shattered pieces of this, of this pot or of this vessel. And um, the idea is to actually highlight the, the cracks and the brokenness. And uh, what is believed within this art form is that when you highlight or put, um, put out for people to see the, the history of this broken vessel or pot, then it actually brings more value and, um, and even greater beauty to uh, that broken piece. And when I came across that, I thought, wow, that's a really wonderful picture of the gospel. Uh, and of the broken relationship that we have because of sin, as well as the repairing that God does uh, in our lives. Because uh, as we see in Genesis chapter 1, we see that God is creating animals and day and, and night and celestial uh, stars and all these sort of amazing things according to their own kind as you see in um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 25. According to their kind is a repeated phrase and, and theme uh, in regards to different animals and uh, diff- various creation. And yet, when we get to verse 26 of chapter 1, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, the creatures that crawl on the earth, So God created man, uh, that is humanity, in his own image. He created them in the image of God. He created them male and female. And so there's a a distinction and a uniqueness to uh, humanity, male and female. And there is beauty and, and value and worth placed upon the human soul. Uh, you know, the Bible says that what will a person give in exchange for their soul? And the answer is given in the question. The answer is the, the human soul is very valuable. There's nothing material of material wealth that you can um, give in exchange. And what, what that means is that there is a salvation or redeeming or a repairing work that needs to take place. And there is nothing that we can do to repair uh, that severed and broken relationship. But in the beginning, it was beautiful. It was perfect. And as we mentioned last week, we see here the, present, uh, the presence of the Trinity in the plural pronouns, let us make man in our likeness. So humanity is the only, uh, is, is the only uh, creation of God that is made in the likeness of God, not according to its own species or its own kind as other animals. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means a few things. One is we have a personality and that personality has uh, the ability to acquire knowledge and information, and with that knowledge and information, to apply a free will. And so we have free will to choose and to make those choices. We also, if we are created in the image or the likeness of God, have um, morality at our core. And so there is a consciousness within us that um, has a moral compass understanding right and wrong. The Bible says that God has placed eternity in our hearts, that uh, we are um, eternal beings in the sense of recognizing that we are physical beings, uh, but also we have a, a body, a soul, and spirit. And so that 
kind of leads to being in the likeness of God spiritually in the sense that you and I, what we really are is not what you see on the outside. That's just your little spacesuit. That's what you need to live on planet Earth and to, you know, get around and walk and deal with gravity and breathe oxygen. And, but who you really are is spiritual. It's a sp spiritual, it's an immaterial life that you have. That's why in Genesis 1, uh, going, going on just a, f a few verses later, he says, And God breathed into the nostrils of humanity the breath of life, and man became a living being. That's the, the pneuma uh, or the spirit, the breath of God. And so that immaterial uh, being of who you are made in the likeness of God, that is where we have the relationship with him. That is where we commune and have fellowship with God. And then lastly, we are very original in um, our design as God is an infinitely creative being. Uh, there's so much originality. And in our originality, there is so much uniqueness to who you are. Uh, there's no one like you, uh, just like there's snowflakes. No snowflake is the same. No, no one of us is the same. And because of that, there is so much worth and value. Now, um, we might think that we get our worth and value from, from other things, uh, you know, and our worth and value does not come from our salary. It does not come from our bank account balance. And that's a good thing because then my worth would be very low right now. We're getting towards the end of the month, so that's a good thing. No, um, so it's not, your worth is not based on that. Um, your, your worth and value is not based on the number of friends you have or likes you get or views or shares that you have on social media. That's not your worth and your value. You don't go on there and numb thumb it through your news feed just completely just spacing out and thinking, wow, this is really life. No, that's not life. That's not worth. That's not value. And that's the lie that we're told. And that's why, which is such a crazy thing. I mean, if we were to take the Bible seriously and literally and understand how God originally intended all humanity to be, then why are we categorizing people? And why are we putting people in various um, identification groups. Well, I'm a Republican and, and I'm uh, a, a Democrat or um, whatever it is. And that's a, a result of, of sin. You know, that's a result of, of the wickedness of the human heart. Um, originally, in God's design, male and female, all lives matter to the Lord. And that's not... Um, a political statement, but it probably is nowadays because we're in a world where we are so uh, divided and so categorized, and you have to have your titles and your, and your labels, and God's not looking at that. God's not looking at the color of your skin or um, the par a political party affiliation. He's not looking at any of those things. Um, he sees beautiful, unique creation made in His image. And He loves you before you ever did anything, before you ever registered as a Democrat or, or a Republican, before you ever did anything. And that's the beauty of God's love, that He has made you unique, and He loves you, and He, he gives you that value. And that's the horrible thing about when we see the introduction of sin and when we see how sin has affected all of the human race and uh, in our interactions and, and culture and, and society. And so if we're, we're looking at, at um, the incomparable significance, let me just en encourage us to, to find, uh, as we sang earlier, our satisfaction um, or our worth. Now, that's the, the pot if you will, uh, going back to the analogy in the beginning, that's the pot that hasn't been broken uh, before sin. That's how God intended it. It's beautiful. Um, but um, when sin entered, it got broken. And just as Adam and Eve 
tried to hide and cover their sin and their brokenness, so you and I try to hide and cover our sin. And the guilt that we experience because of sin has created a gulf, chasm between us and God. And so as we see also, I mean, that's a, that's a you know, just a, an analogy. But if you look biblically, you can even see um, the prophet Jeremiah. And uh, he was uh, told to go to a, the potter's house. And he went to the potter's house and he saw the master craftsman uh, working with a thing of clay. And um, he was making something intentional and beautiful. And, and yet uh, he noticed that something happened to the, the clay or to the pot as he was working on it. It got marred and, and damaged. But the interesting thing is that he didn't throw the clay out. He repurposed that same clay and made something new out of the broken and marred piece. And, and the Lord used that as a, as a spiritual principle for Jeremiah to understand in his life and in his ministry, as well as for the people of God. He says in Jeremiah 18, Can I not treat you as this potter treats his clay? This is the Lord's declaration. Just like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. And if we're in God's hands, then he can make us however he wants to make us. He can make you with no hair, like I don't have hair. Or he can make you with a lot of hair, and that's a great thing. He can make you with dark skin or, or light skin, um, and uh, whatever it is. Uh, but that's the way God cre creates you and loves you and, and calls you. And so there is this value and worth and significance um, attributed to every single human being. Now, the problem is that the human dignity that God originally created has been distorted by the depravity. Now, what do we mean by depravity? Well, depravity is basically just another theological word for sin. And uh, that sin is complete and total uh, and um, all-encompassing. As the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In fact, Jeremiah would go on to later say that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? And really, the, the source or the reason for God bringing the flood, if you remember back in Genesis, uh, beginning of Genesis, the reason for the flood is that God looked upon all of humanity, and he said that, that, that within their heart, they are only and always continually evil and wicked in their thoughts and in their intents within their heart. And so he recognized that, as the uh, book of Romans tells us, that through one man's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, which is Adam, sin entered the human race. And so let's just take a quick look at that in... Um, Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6. Now, the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat, when you eat the rotisserie chicken, no, just kidding, we had that tonight, but uh, when you eat it, uh, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw that the tree was, uh, number one, good for food, number two, delightful to look at, number three, desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, in context here, we need to understand that Adam and Eve are just having a, a beautiful relationship and walk, talk, walking and talking with God in the cool of uh, this beautiful garden. And uh, the beginning of, of sin starts off with this temptation. And... In the garden of delight, Satan plants a seed of doubt. And what is that doubt? That doubt is concerning God's word. There is neglect and there is doubt about what God 
has set. And that, even to this day, is the, uh, the one-two punch that Satan will use on you every single day. The Bible says that he's a, a liar and a deceiver and uh, constantly um, trying to tempt us. And, uh, and doubt, notice what the doubt is, is um, concerning. He says, did God really say? Well, I don't know. Did he? I'm not sure. I don't know. Well, how would I know? Well, I would know what God said if I was reading what God said, if I was close to what God said, if I kept it to heart. And uh, I have found that a lot of the lies that Satan will bring in to tempt me or to discourage me uh, will be used in such a tricky way. And sometimes I can really just identify him and be like, not this day. Was there a song about that? Not today, Satan or something. I don't know what that, how that goes. But, um, and uh, I got you. That's, that's an easy one. Or sometimes he'll really, uh, when, when I'm feeling, I don't know, discouraged and down, um, Maybe I haven't been in my word. And uh, he'll twist and he'll manipulate. But he says, oh, that's not really going to happen. You, you, know, you can eat from these things. You will not die. So what does he say? He says he doubts. He makes you doubt the goodness of God and the badness of sin. God is good. And he's given you all this wonderful, beautiful, awesome garden. Except for this one thing. Remember, we're made in his likeness, so we have a free will. God doesn't want robots worshiping him, but those who would freely choose to obey him, that is true love when we surrender and when we obey. And so God is not good because he's saying, I can't have that. Well, that's what Satan is saying. And maybe that's sometimes what we think. Well, I can't have that because, uh, well, because I can't have that, God's not good. Wow. No. If God says it's not good, then that's not good for me. And I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to experiment with anything that might not be good for me. Sin usually starts off with just a simple touch or a compromise. And so, well, maybe it's to doubt the goodness of God or the badness of sin. You won't surely die. Whoa, yeah, you actually will. And there are serious consequences to um, disobeying and breaking God's law. And uh, if we don't take that seriously, well, then, you know, the good news isn't good anymore if the bad news, bad news isn't bad. And God is a good, good father, as we sing. Um, and so he's watching out for us and wants the best for us. And when he says, whoa, hold up, no, don't go there, then we don't want to go there. But there's something that draws us and entices us and lures us. And what happens is, is they give in to that temptation and it brings with it this depravity and this sin that has affected every single one of us. And these consequences um, are eternal separation from God. These consequences are divine judgment uh, because of our sin. And uh, that's what happened for Adam and Eve. They were separated from God. Uh, they actually separated themselves from God first, and then God removed them from the Garden of Eden. And uh, even then, God uh, gave uh, a promise and a, and a, a ray of hope um, about his redemptive plan through the seed of the woman who would come and crush the serpent's head and bring a restoration and a repairing of this relationship. So now think of yourself with significance and value and worth because God has formed you and fashioned you, and he has breathed into your nostrils the breath of life, and he has said, I love you with an everlasting love. But you and I have gone our own way. As the Bible says, all we are like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so now we walk away and we wander from God and we give in to that temptation and we embrace compromise and sin. And, and it, it's uh, kind of like Jesus says it, in the Gospels, uh, like leaven, it's a, a baker's analogy. And leaven is just this small little thing that uh, you put inside of a dough at, or yeast, right? Same thing, right? Um, and it, it, it works its way all throughout the entire lump of dough. And so is the sense of sin, that uh, a little compromise and 
that uh, little bit of sin has worked its way into every intent and every thought. Can, can you think about that is why our world is so divided. That is why we have murders in the middle of the day and why we have riots and burning and hatred. And that is why we have wars and, and that is why we have disease and pandemics. And that is why we have death and that is why we have racism and hatred in the heart. And that is why we have abortions and suicide. That's why we have divorce. All these things. That's the answer. Listen, we don't need a political leader to save us. We don't need a, a, a movement. We don't need a vaccine. Uh, we don't need, um, I don't know, anything. What, what we need is the Lord Jesus Christ. What we need is uh, the one who has the vaccine for the disease of sin. Because what we see in our world and on the news is the symptoms of, of the problem. And we could do all we can to, I mean, I'm not saying don't vote. And I'm not saying don't vaccine. And I'm not saying don't be healthy and practice these sort of things. But that's Ultimately, this is about life and death and eternal life and death. And what our world needs is repair spiritually. And it starts by repairing the human heart. And the human heart is, needs to be restored and, and redeemed and, and reconciled back to God. That's the, uh, that's the pandemic. And so what happens is, is here we, we have been broken. And because of sin, um, all have sinned, the Bible says, and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. And so what we do is we try to, we try to put ourselves back together like that broken pot. And a lot of times we put it back together by uh, making it look like we were never broken in the first place. And we put on the outside a, an appearance like we're okay, like everything's fine. Like, we're doing all right. But on the inside, we know that just even a little win or just a little struggle or just a little challenge and everything that we're, all those plates that we have in the air that we're trying to spin, they're going to come crashing down or all the things that we're trying to hold and piece together is just going to become, come unglued in our lives. And so then, well, we tried other things. We try to cope and we try to medicate self-medicate and we realize that that's that's not going to satisfy and that's only temporary or then we try religion and we try well we're just going to be good and we're going to uh, give charitable donations and we're not we're going to try not to lie and cheat on our taxes and be a good neighbor and mow my lawn and vote or whatever it is what we think is good and right and be a good person well that's that's false there are no good people none and so we have all of these broken pieces in our lives because of sin. And I would just add in, we'll just kind of end with this, but uh, because it's not part of this study, but it's a part of next study, next week's study, which is um, soteriology, and that's the doctrine of salvation. And I just cannot give a Bible study by looking at, at all the sin and the destruction that it has in our lives and the separation without saying, but hold up, there's hope. We'll go into greater detail next week, but uh, I would suggest a third uh, principle here. Uh, I had one point uh, with the dignity of humanity, and second point with the depravity of humanity, and then I would just add 2.1, which is the deliverance, that, that there is a determination on our loving Heavenly Father to bring human deliverance, that every human life is completed by incredible salvation and that salvation work is accomplished through the person of Jesus Christ and so if you have found Jesus and you have committed your life to Jesus and you have received his forgiveness of your sins then 
the beautiful thing is that God has pieced you back together. And I would encourage you not to hide all the brokenness in your life. Because when we as, because even the Paul the Apostle says, we hold these things in, in the earthen vessels, this mystery of, of God and, and of our relationship with Him and His salvation work and um, just this beautiful relationship. We, hold, we, we have this in earthen vessels. And when, when the, the glue that pieces back together the broken parts of your sinful life is the blood, the crimson, the red, precious, whereas there was precious gold and silver for this pottery. For your life, for your soul, it's the precious red blood of Jesus Christ that goes all into the cracks and holds you together so that now when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees the person of Jesus. And you can now, as Paul the Apostle, boast in your brokenness. You can say, well, it's not in my goodness, it's in my brokenness. And when people see Jesus in the cracks of your broken life, holding you together, that's what this world of racism and hatred and division and anger and murder and strife need. It's when the human heart, broken in sin, comes in contact with the crimson flowed, flowing blood of Calvary, that they are truly healed and that they are truly mended. That's the only hope that we have. That's the hope that we have for humanity and the hope that we have for solving sin. And we'll go into greater detail next week, but we'll break up into our groups tonight. And uh, you guys can stay in your tables or if you guys are seated in the back, maybe join one of the tables or turn around. You guys can do that, but um, let me pray for us, and uh, we'll spend the rest of the time discussing maybe some themes or thoughts that stand out to you in these scripture verses, or maybe a few questions uh, that have been mentioned in the study guide. Let the Holy Spirit lead you guys. So, Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this reality check of what's really going on under the surface here of our lives. And, and that is that you love everyone, all lives. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's not just a privilege or an entitlement for some. That's whosoever. Whosoever is whosoever. Anybody and everybody. And we thank you, God, that you're not looking at anything else temporal, but... We want to have that same heart for other people. Help us to see other people with intrinsic value. Not to be divided in our little camps or in our little groups. But Lord, enlarge our heart for people who you place in front of us. Because every single person that we come in contact with, so deeply loved by you. And Lord, we recognize in our heart and in our world that there is so much sin. And for those of us who have found forgiveness and hope and healing in Jesus Christ, we thank you. We thank you for restoring um, and repairing us. But those who have not found hope in Christ, I want to encourage you to call upon him, whether in this room or online, that Christ is the only hope and the only satisfaction that you can have in life because that's what you were created for. You were created to be in relationship with God and God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die a death that you could not die, to pay a price that you could not pay and to raise from the dead to give you eternal life if you put your faith and trust in Him. And you do that simply by confessing your sin, confessing and repenting, and receiving Him as your Lord and Savior. So if that is your desire and prayer, I encourage you to 
make that decision tonight. Let us know about that decision, and we will encourage you and support you and pray for you. So we love you, God. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. All right, well, we're going to end our Facebook feed right now. God bless you guys online. Thanks for joining us. Go ahead and talk about the scriptures, and we'll do the same here. Sound good?